Away Melancholy by Stevie Smith appeared in her 1957 collection, Not Waving But Drowning. To be melancholy is to have an absorbing, inescapable feeling of sadness, which typically has no obvious cause. Smith suffered from, and was treated for, depression throughout her life. Having contracted tuberculosis peritonitis at the age of five, she'd been sent away to a sanatorium where she stayed for three years, later revealing that this caused her to develop, by the age of seven, a preoccupation with death, triggered by the feeling of acute distress she experienced at having been separated from her mother for so long. By the age of eight, she had contemplated suicide, and in 1953, some four years before the publication of this collection, she had suffered a nervous breakdown, causing her to leave her job. The writer, Clive James, said of her work in his 2003 book, As Off This Writing, her poems, if they were pills to cure melancholy, did not work for her. The best of them, however, worked like charms for everyone else. The poem is an internal monologue, where the speaker talks to herself as she tries to shake off this feeling of melancholy that has such a hold on her. She reflects on the natural world and humankind's place in it, recognising that while we, in similarity to the ant, are animals driven by the urge to survive, we are also, in contrast to the ant, capable of conscious reasoning and morality, which has led us to personify the abstract idea of good into the figure of God, whom we worship. The speaker then argues with themselves about the extent to which God can be synonymous only with good. If God is our creation, then he is also made of sadness, oppression, disease and war, which are, of course, evil. She dismisses this, however, asserting instead that it is enough that humankind aspires to good and that this is what we call God and that even when we are at our lowest ebb, on the point of death, we turn our gaze upwards with the word love longingly on our lips. In the end, the speaker concludes that it is this tendency towards virtue, in the face of all that is bad in the world, that is miraculous, i.e. that needs explaining, rather than any moral failing on our part, and this should be sufficient to chase melancholy away. The poem comprises nine stanzas of varying length, with the shortest of two lines and the longest of ten. It's written in free verse, which means that it has no fixed rhythmical structure or bass metre and no set rhyme scheme. That's not to say, however, that Smith does not create rhythmical ebbs and flows with varying line lengths, extensive enjambment and examples of caesura. Line lengths are generally quite short, on average containing only five or six syllables, although there is an extensive range between one syllable, e.g. size, and nine syllables, e.g. away, melancholy, let it go. Some examples of enjambment do serve to obscure syntax somewhat, where the introduction of a comma or full stop would clarify meaning, and this at times can hinder understanding. Caesura does in places chop already short lines into even smaller units, creating a somewhat jerky rhythm, e.g. calling good God. These rhythmical choices on the part of the poet result in a poem which effectively evokes a state of mind in the speaker which is disjointed and anxious. What gives the poem a sense of cohesion are the various permutations of the words from the first stanza. Away, melancholy, away with it, let it go. Which appear in some shape or form within and at the end of subsequent stanzas throughout. These words become a refrain or mantra, as though the speaker is making a conscious but not entirely successful effort to rid herself of this negativity. Note the way in which the final example in the poem's last line does not feature a full stop. Away with it, let it go. 
perhaps suggesting that the speaker's struggle is nowhere near over. Even though there's no set rhyme scheme, there is actually extensive rhyming in the form of identical rhyme, i.e. green, green, and god, god. Perfect masculine rhyme, e.g. blow, flow, and alone, stone. Forced or oblique rhyme, e.g. busy, hurry. Pararhyme, e.g. good, god. And syllabic rhyme, e.g. hurries. Berries. The often disjointed and unpredictable nature of this, often imperfect rhyming, helps to evoke the speaker's obviously fragile state of mind. Smith's diction is fairly plain and simple and is enhanced by the very short line lengths. This superficial simplicity, however, is deceptive and belies the complexity of the issues which she confronts. Note how she also uses archaic verb forms such as carrieth and raiseth, a form of language which we most readily associate with the Bible, suggesting that she wants the statements she is making to appear as though they bear some kind of universal and long-standing truth. The title, Away Melancholy, is simply the first line of the poem and sums up the speaker's central preoccupation which is to try to rid herself of this sense of gloominess and sadness which seems to pervade her soul. The poem begins, Away, melancholy, away with it, let it go. Note the anaphora here with the repetition of away at the beginning of the first two lines, already implying that this feeling of sadness and gloominess will be hard to shift. The phrasal verb, let it go, which is written in the imperative mood, suggests that she feels that it is she who is the one holding on to these negative feelings and that if she makes a conscious effort she will, in a moment of empowerment, be able to cast them off. In the second stanza she turns to the natural world in search of reasons why she should release this grip on melancholy. Are not the trees green, the earth is green? Does not the wind blow, fire leap and the rivers flow? In these two rhetorical questions, which come in immediate succession, she reminds herself that the world around her is full of life, with the repetition of the adjective green, evoking a lush and verdant land. The elemental forces of air, fire and water do not succumb or give in to melancholy, but are instead full of power and energy, as suggested by the dynamic and invigorating verbs blow, leap and flow. Note also the consonants of the liquid l sounds in these verbs, strengthened by the masculine rhyme in two successive lines, which helps to enhance this sense of movement. The world is in balance and everything is as it should be, she tells herself, and so the implication is, logically, there is nothing to be gloomy about. She ends the stanza with the assertive command, away, melancholy. In the third stanza, the speaker shifts her focus from the world's physical character to the animals which live in it. The ant is busy, he carrieth his meat. Note the subtle way in which Smith anthropomorphises the ant here through the choice of the adjective busy and the personal pronouns he and his, rather than it and its, to communicate how even one of the world's smallest creatures has a sense of purpose driven by the instinct to find food in order to survive. In fact, she says, all things hurry to be eaten or eat. We are all part of the web of life in which we are either prey or predator, communicated by the polyptotonic, to be eaten or eat. Once more, she ends the stanza with the simple mantra, away, melancholy. In the fourth stanza, Smith shifts her focus once more, but this time it is onto man or humankind. Man, too, hurries, eats, couples, berries. Note the way in which Smith uses an asyndetic list here of simple verbs in the present tense to communicate how humankind is not so dissimilar to the ant, 
and that our actions too are purposeful as well as cyclical. We are driven, or are made to hurry, by the same unconscious urge or base instinct as the ant to survive, to eat so that we may couple or have sex and procreate, in order to leave offspring behind us to continue the cycle of life before we are buried. In that way, she asserts, humankind is an animal also. She ends the stanza on a variation of her mantra, this time with a hey-ho melancholy, away with it, let it go. The exclamation hey-ho has nautical origins like heave-ho, both of which were used to mark the rhythm of heaving or hauling the ropes on a ship. And there's a sense here of the weight of this gloominess that she feels bearing down on herself and the strength and conscious effort that is required to shrug it off. In what is the longest and probably most obscure stanza of the poem, Smith explores the way in which man, or humankind, is different from other animals. Man, she says, of all creatures is superlative. The adjective superlative means to be of the highest quality or degree, so in other words she is saying that humankind is superior to all other animals. Know the way in which her mantra now appears almost as an aside, in parenthesis, within the stanza as well as at the end, interrupting her argument and perhaps communicating that the issues she is now exploring cause her an increased sadness which intrudes on her thoughts. She asserts that it is he of all creatures alone who raiseth a stone. Taken in isolation, this seems puzzling. What does it mean to raise a stone? The clue is to be found in the rest of the stanza, which can seem a little obscure on a first reading, but in essence refers to the invention of the concept of good and the way in which this has been personified to create a god that is worshipped by humankind. The stone, therefore, becomes a metaphor for morality and religion. She interrupts herself once more with a repeated away melancholy, before continuing, Into the stone the god pours what he knows of good, calling good god. Here, she argues, it is only man who is capable of taking a literal stone and attaching symbolic meaning to it, i.e. by pouring what he knows of good into it. It's possible that Smith is alluding here to the Neolithic stone circle that is Stonehenge, or perhaps even to the Ten Commandments, which, according to the Bible, were given by God to Moses on Mount Sinai, and which were inscribed on stone tablets. What's important, though, is that we understand that the literal stone, with its own associations of solidity and immovability, comes to symbolise the concept of good or morality, and becomes transformed into a metaphor in the process. Note how she calls humankind here the god, with a lowercase g, which refers back to her having called it superlative in the second line of the stanza, once more underscoring its power. The final part of the process is where the concept of good, through its personification, has become synonymous with the idea of God, calling good, God, i.e. good equals God, as abstract ideas become deities and form the basis of religion. Note how the repeated God is now capitalised to indicate this transformation. In summary then, the speaker is basically arguing that humankind is the only species with the capability of symbolic thought and the ability to create abstract concepts such as morality, which has in turn led to the invention of religion. She ends the stanza with her mantra, Away melancholy, let it go. In the next stanza, she addresses the argument that appears to be made by the part of her psyche that is stubbornly still within melancholy's grip. It seems to act almost as a devil's advocate, reminding her that God is the stone of man's thoughts, i.e. that God is humankind's creation and therefore cannot be good because our thoughts also tend towards ill 
in the shape of tears, tyranny, pox, wars, or grief, oppression, disease and violence. Note how she again makes use of A. Sinderton here, which suggests that this list may not be a complete summary of our potential for evil, with the plosive alliteration of tears, tyranny, and the also plosive pox, introducing a harsh note. She dismisses this nagging voice, however, commanding it to speak not to me of them as evidence that the influence of God should be dismissed. She argues back, say rather it is enough that the stuffed stone of man's good growing by man's called God. In other words, she says that it is sufficient that what we choose to call God is the ample and growing good side of human nature that we have stuffed into the stone. Once more, she directs herself to let go of melancholy. After two lengthy and somewhat opaque stanzas, Smith shakes up the rhythm with a very concise four-line stanza. Man aspires to good, to love, sighs. In summary, she says man aspires or aims towards good and longs for or sighs towards love. And this, she implies, seems to be enough. She expands on this train of thought in the next stanza as she describes man at his lowest ebb, on his deathbed, either at the hand of violence or disease, beaten, corrupted, dying in his own blood lying, who yet, or even so, still heaves up an eye above, presumably to God, and cries love, love. Note the verb heaves here, which communicates great weight and effort, implying that our instinct is towards love and goodness, whatever the effort required, even at times of greatest adversity. It is this, or man's virtue, she says, that needs explaining, or that needs to be better understood and justified, not our moral failing. In other words, she says, there is more value to be found in exploring humankind's innate goodness rather than our moral lapses, because this is where the true miracle lies. The poem ends as it began. Away, melancholy, away with it, let it go. Its circular structure, implying that the speaker's struggle with melancholy is ongoing and cyclical, further suggested by the lack of a full stop at the end. The final irony is, of course, that it is only because we are able to reason and reflect on abstract concepts such as good and evil that we are able to suffer from melancholy in the first place, a curse which simpler creatures, such as the ant, escape. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.